I hope we won't need this, but we've got it in case we do. Oh, hey. Just uh, checking out the battery backup here. We bought this two years ago. There was a winter storm coming through, and we wanted to be prepared. This is one of those things that can charge, uh, looks like, about uh, six different devices, and it's got a USB port. We can use it. If the power goes out, it's supposed to last up to eight hours. Being prepared is something we all need to do for various things, such as storms. I mean, right now it's springtime, but uh, there's quite a bit of weather activity in the area. Thunder and lightning uh, can strike, and lightning can knock out your power, just like a snowstorm can. So you need to be prepared. If you're driving on a road trip in the winter, you need to have maybe blankets and warm clothes, just in case you break down or have a problem. And that's not the only place we need to be prepared. Are you prepared to give an answer if someone asks you why you're a Christian? Or why do you go to the church that you do? Or why do you believe that water uh, baptism is essential to salvation? Or why do you believe that it's got to be immersion? What answer would you give? Well, we're going to look at the need to be prepared in this lesson today. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, Always be ready to give an answer to those who ask you reason for the hope that it is within you. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul tells us that there will come a time when some will not endure sound doctrine, but they're going to want their ears tickled. Well, that's been going on really almost from the get-go, but it seems to be getting worse here in the 21st century. So, get your Bibles, open up to 2 Timothy chapter 4, don't forget to hit that subscribe bar and subscribe to the channel, and then click on the notification bell so you'll be notified whenever I add content to the channel. Comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos. All set, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and remember, if you're not careful, you might just learn something before we're done. So, let's get started. You're going to get a charge out of this lesson. Today's scripture is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who would judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. Just going to be starting a series today based on this book by Paul Copen, called True For You, But Not For Me. I read it several years ago, and it's a really good resource for talking to our friends who aren't Christians, and it helps to give answers to some of the common objections we get to Christianity, such as all religions lead to God, or Jesus, you know, he was really just another great philosophical teacher. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, churches, one is just as good as another. Uh, you know, your idea of right and wrong may not be mine, and that, that sort of thing. And it helps us to come up with answers uh, to some of these uh, questions and some of these discussion points. Uh, most of the uh, answers that he gives, aren't that, they're not that long, they're fairly short, so you could take this and read it through in a couple of days uh, if you're a reader. Now, I want to look at this series that um, I'm calling to uh, answer our culture. Because you're going to see this a lot. I don't know if you can see the uh, type uh, underneath the, the, the uh, cartoon. But he's asking, can I get a customized Bible geared specifically for the way I want to live? Now that explains a lot in our modern religious world. When people are looking for a Bible or they're looking for a church, they're not necessarily looking for a church that's going to teach the truth and help them uh, better their lives. What they're looking for is a place that will affirm what I already believe. 
I believe one church is just as good as another. I think Jesus was a great philosophical uh, teacher. Yeah, he's my savior, but I don't believe the whole Bible. Or I don't, I'll don't. i believe the Bible, but I don't really like what it says there, those first six chapters of Genesis. I can't swallow that. Um, it th uh, thing, things like that. They'll take parts of the scriptures, but not all of it. And that is, of course, going to be a problem because the Bible is something you have to take all of it or none of it. And Charles Wesley composed a hymn, and I was a little slow on the draw. I meant to ask for this one, and I just didn't uh, do it. I just forgot. I think it's 58 in our book, A Charge to Keep I Have. And the book, or, or Wesley's inspiration came from this passage in Leviticus, chapter 8, verse 35. Therefore you shall stay at the door of the tabernacle of meeting day and night for seven days and keep the charge of the Lord so that you may not die, for so I have been commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses. This was where they are given their charge, and I would submit to you today, we have a charge that God has given us, and that is to be faithful to what he has given us in the scriptures, to have an answer for why we believe them, because so much of the world is adrift, kind of like this boat here. It doesn't have any way really to keep it uh, anchored down. Now, when I was about six or seven, my dad took me fishing on a lake, and we rented a little, a little boat, and it had oars on it, and he rowed us out there where we started fishing, and he told me to drop the anchor, and there was an anchor in the boat. The anchor was actually an old tin coffee can filled with cement, so I just chucked it over, and I could see the water was clear. It had a little greenish tint, but you could see to the bottom, and I looked down, and that chain was not reaching all the way to the bottom. I think it was about a six foot long chain and the lake was about 10 feet deep. What good did that do to hold us? And then we drifted across the lake. I mean, it was a lake out on the Air Force base where he was assigned. So it's not like we're out in the middle of the Atlantic or something. So it was no big deal, but it wasn't holding us. And a lot of people in the religious world today are just like that boat. They got so many churches, so many denominations are changing and wanting to go in different directions and leave the scriptures. I think there's an opportunity here if we take advantage of it to find the people that are still wanting sound Bible teaching. Jesus said that I have, this is his final prayer before he goes to the cross. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And when I think about, there's a book I read uh, last year called Why Christianity Must Change or Die, and I think about these people who insist that Christianity needs to change to be more inclusive, more accepting, more open. Then look at what Jesus said here. The world has hated them because they are not of the world. Does that sound like Jesus is telling us to be inclusive and accept everybody with whatever lifestyle choices they have to come on in and it's all good, we all be one happy family? Does that, is that what that sounds like? It sounds to me like Jesus is saying no uh, to, to his father, no, my people, Christians, are going to be going in a completely different direction than the world. We are not to be mixing in. And in fact, then, as I've said before, when I look at Old Testament Israel, and I look at what the direction the world is going in today, our, our nation, what churches are doing, I look at that and I think, you know, I've seen this movie before. And I don't think it had a happy ending. You know, in Hollywood, there's always supposed to be a happy ending. The, the good guy saves the damsel in distress, saves the world, kills the bad guy, or the bad guy might, it might be questionable whether or not he went over the cliff so they can set up for a sequel, or he goes to jail and then they're set up for a sequel, but it's all a happy ending. But life doesn't always come out like a Hollywood movie. Hollywood's got better screenwriters, I guess, than most of us do, but it doesn't come out that way. And you look at Israel, and when they rejected God, it was a very unhappy ending. And it's going to be the same with us. And this is probably the biggest issue right now that we've got facing us, are, is the sexual uh, immorality that is going on uh, in our nation. And I came across this video this week. Uh, actually, it was uh, several weeks ago that I came across it, but I revisited it this week. And this is out of, uh, he's out of Douglas, Michigan, out of the Congregational United Church of Christ. Now, the United Church of Christ has nothing to do with us. It's a 
Very liberal denomination founded, in, I believe, in the 1950s, if I remember correctly. And I've got the link if anybody wants to see the whole thing in its context, so you can see I'm, I'm not uh, uh, abusing anything here. But his sermon was a progressive Christian looks at John 3.16. I don't believe these, uh, this is a progressive Christian. It's what I call a regressive uh, Christian, because what they try to do is they're trying to take Christianity and drag it back down to being just another man-made religion. And in this sermon, he said that Jesus said, follow the way, and what, and what was the way? The way of forgiveness, the way of service, follow the way of unconditional love, because Jesus knew that when you lived from that way, you stopped listening to the voice of the ego, the voice of the small self, the voice of separation and darkness. You start to awaken more and more to the light of your true self. I don't have a problem with unconditional love and Jesus uh, uh, wanting to take us to, to service and forget. I don't have that problem, but here's where I have a problem. Uh, when he says, to, uh, well, when he says uh, uh, more and more to the light of your true self, to your divine self, your Christ self. So Jesus didn't say that he was the only one. In fact, if you read the scripture or read the gospels, he says just the opposite. He stood in front of crowds of people and said, you are sons and daughters of God. He said that you are the light of the world. He said, all of the things that I have done, you can do. I have a big problem with this. I don't have a divine self. There is, God is not in me in the sense I have any divinity. Or your Christ self. Christ was the anointed one. He was sent specially. I don't have a Christ self in me. And Jesus did say he's the only one. John, Not just John chapter 14 that we like to go to. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he said, if you do not believe I am he, you will die in your sins. John chapter 8 verse 58. The ego ami, when he said, before Abraham was, I am. That is a direct reference back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where God is speaking to Moses from the burning bush, go to Pharaoh, tell him, let my people go. Okay, well, I go to Pharaoh. Who am I going to say sent me? Thus you shall say to Pharaoh, I am has sent you to me. I am, ego a me. And when Jesus said before Abraham, I, ego a me, they took up stones. Why? To stone him. Why did they want to stone him? Because he was claiming to be God, and they knew it, and they recognized it. Jesus said very plainly how we are to get to God. It is through him. So I want to look at this, answering our culture for the next couple of weeks. And the ideas that we have to uh, be prepared to start with. Anybody here was a boy scout? Any of you guys who were boy scouts? You remember what the motto was? Be prepared. What do we need to be prepared for? Well couple of things we're going to get into here. First of all, understand people are going to reject truth. We have to understand that. Not everybody is going to accept the truth of Scripture. The story is told of a farmer that had a busload of politicians overturn on his land, went out and he checked it out, dug a hole, and he buried them all there. When the sheriff came out and asked what had happened, the farmer said, don't worry about it, I took care of it, I buried them. And the sheriff said, wait a minute, the coroner didn't get out there, the medical examiner, are you sure all those people were dead? The farmer said, well, some of them told me they weren't dead, but you know how them politicians lie. Some people just don't want to listen when the truth is put right in front of them. I read a story about a man for the, with the 101st Airborne in World War II. He wasn't with the Band of Brothers Regiment, he was with another one. Got separated from his unit, and they found a body that looked like his and thought he was killed in action. When uh, he finally re-upped re with his unit, they said, look, you need to get something to your parents, because right now the Red Cross is in the process of telling them you're dead. His company commander just said, here, take the Jeep, go. And he hustled it in there, got to where he needed to be, and he came in, and, and he had his dog tags, he had some ID, but he said they wouldn't just take his word for it that he was alive and standing right there in front of him. He had to jump through a lot of hoops to get the truth out. 1 Timothy 4, if you got your Bibles open or on your tablets, have a look at that. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That actually happened starting way back then. They were having problems with people accepting sound doctrine. Now, why do people reject truth? Well, first of all, going against previous knowledge. As we, as we grow up, those who grew up in a particular religious tradition, and then they get confronted with New Testament Christianity, and uh-oh, now what do I do? Because what you're telling me goes against what I was taught. You know, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, teaching in my childhood, 
But I did believe that when I prayed that sinner's prayer that night that I was saved. And then one day I had a roommate that confronted me well, with biblical teaching. Oh, now what do I do? And it took a little time to accept that. I had a roommate whose brother-in-law, uh, he got a study with his sister and, and she became a Christian. Took more than a year uh, with his brother-in-law working on him, studying with him. And the problem was he grew up in a denomination and he said, you know, I just can't believe that everything that that minister told me is wrong. And not everything was wrong, but there were a few key things that were wrong. And finally, the night before they hit the road to leave the state, he was finally baptized late at night, uh, just in time. And I think uh, he even eventually served as an elder in, uh, in the Lord's church. But the problem was him accepting the fact that he had been taught error all those years. That's inconvenient for us, which is the next reason why people will uh, reject truth. It's inconvenient. I don't want to do it. I think this is where a lot of people are right now. I have my life, I'm living, I'm doing what I want to do, it's inconvenient, I don't want to change. Several years ago, we uh, had a Sunday school class that was meeting in my office, and a phone, a phone call came just before we started class, and I answered, it was a young lady who said, hey, I'm looking for, to talk to somebody at, at a church, I want to be baptized. Uh, this is the only time this has happened, I don't know if anybody else has ever had this, this is the only time it's ever happened with me. I said, great, come on in. So we, she came in, was visibly pregnant. We talked to her, studied with her. And then in the end, uh, she was living with her boyfriend. And I said, well, you know, we, that's not going to work. And I explained to her why. We had a, it was just the two of us. We had a, a big house at the time, uh, Parsonage. I said, we got plenty of room. You know, you can come stay with us. Uh, or we can go ahead, get the paperwork tomorrow, Monday morning, first thing. We can do the wedding. No, we want a big blowout wedding with all the trimmings. And I said, well, we could do a little private thing now and then, you know, reenact it later. You know, we can make this right. No, she wouldn't do it. Couldn't baptize her. It was inconvenient for her to simply do what the Bible said to do at that point. In 1 Corinthians, Paul uh, had the same issue with, with the Corinthians. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Rhetorical question, really. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now notice, such were some of you. Let's back up a second here and look at that list of sin. Now, this is one of the so-called clobber passages uh, about homosexuality, but look at the other sins. It's not dealing with just one sin. It's dealing with several. And notice, again, such were some of you. Every one of these, these uh, sins that he lists, people in Corinth practice, they all manage to get away from them. Now, did they all have an easy time of it? I doubt it. There were probably some people who struggled with alcohol and substance abuse, just like we have people today who struggle with it. There were probably people who struggled with sexual sins all their lives, struggled with uh, covetous and all these sins. People do struggle with these sometimes. But Paul says, you were, such were some of you. They were able to become Christians. They were able to not pray. They were able to get away, maybe get drawn back occasionally, but they were able to get out of that. It may have been a struggle for some. Some may have walked away without uh, giving it a second thought. And then he also told the Galatians, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry. Look again, a lot of the same things he mentioned to the Corinthians. And here's what I want to get at where he says, uh, uh, the, uh, which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past. So more than once he's told them. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice the word practice. Not talking about an occasional slipping into sin. He's talking, I am going to do this. Uh, this is how I'm going to live my life as a reveler or as a, a, with envy or murderer or however, whichever one of these, whoops, whichever one of these you want to plug into. If you're going to be practicing that, if you're going to make that your way of life, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. No, that's not me talking. That's what the Word says. That's just what the book says. And that's what we're concerned with. What does the book say? And sometimes it's going to be a little difficult if people don't want to accept biblical authority. 
you know, you can't solve every problem. Some, th some, some things are not going to be fixable. But someone who is genuinely interested, we can go and show them from Scripture where change needs to happen. Someone who doesn't understand Bible teaching, as far as they're concerned, we have to give up all the fun in our lives. Now, John Clayton uh, over uh, in uh, Indiana, uh, we've invited him. He started the uh, Does God Exist program, and uh, he taught high school science for many years. And uh, we hosted him several times to present his seminar. And at Sunday morning uh, preaching time, I always asked him to preach the lesson, Why I Left Atheism. And in that, because he was raised as an atheist, uh, and he'll tell you uh, in the very beginning of it, he said, I'm not going to lie to you, especially to young people. I had fun as an atheist. He lived in Bloomington. Indianapolis was the party town. If my parents told me I couldn't go to Indianapolis, I just disconnected the speedometer on the car and I went anyway. He didn't care what they wanted or what they thought. And to a lot of people, that's fun. And I'll tell you, before I became a Christian, yeah, I had a lot of fun. Did a lot of things I wouldn't do now as a, as a Christian. But then when I became a Christian, I found out, you know what, Christians can still have fun, we can still enjoy life, but we've got different uh, parameters that we're going to stay within that people who aren't Christians will, uh, will cross. I had a dorm meeting one time in college, and there were people there who flat said, I go to a party to get drunk. I go to a party because I want to toke some dope. I want to do all these other things. And, you know, as a Christian, I go to parties, but I don't do any of that. So it's not got anything to do with Paul wanting to uh, uh, take away fun. It's got to do with setting boundaries, keeping us spiritually safe, keeping us living a life that is pleasing to God. And people like to gather with those who agree with them. You know, most of us, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess, we don't like to argue and fight a lot. We like to be around people who agree with us on at least basic fundamental things. Kind of a birds of a feather flock together sort of thing. But look here at what Timothy says. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I'm gathering a bunch of yes men around me is, is what this is saying. Just to tell me what I want to hear. You know, we all like to be around people we agree with, and that's especially true with Christian fellowship. And there may be some things that you and I don't agree on, but those aren't going to be what I would consider the salvation issues, the things that are, are make or break. You know, there are some things may not agree on a Bible translation or a particular method of outreach or something. That's okay. But when it comes to things like, how do I become a Christian? What is the definition of sin? Uh, uh, things like that. How does God want me to live a righteous life? We probably all are going to agree on, on pretty much everything there. But if you reject Christ, those who don't want to live a Christian life, they've got people living around them, encouraging them to continue on. Don't uh, get into that religion, Christianity stuff. You're having a lot of fun. Why would you want to do that? You know, there's, you know, we we've got science now, and and I've heard people say, oh, you know, I believe in science. Yeah, well, so do I. I also believe the Bible. You can believe in both, believe it or not. And so uh, I'm going to want people around me who who will uh, be thinking more like me than 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 uh, than not. So look at what Paul's doing here. Look again at verse three, and you'll notice that Paul is speaking about false teachers and looking at their evil intentions. Uh, but remember, they need an audience. False teaching is not going to get anywhere without an audience. And we have to remember, we were talking a little bit about this in class uh, this morning. You know, false teachers come in, they don't generally walk in the front door and say, Hi there, I'm a false teacher. I'm here to uh, lead you astray and lead people to hell. And who's, who's with me? Huh? Who wants? They don't generally do it that way. It's generally more subtle, it's generally uh, under the radar, stealth. Or it's like the wolves in sheep's clothing. They come in looking like us. They'll talk like us. But as time goes on, yeah, there'll be a little bit of truth in there in what they said. And then they start to get further and further off. And many times it's, you're about off the cliff before you catch it. See, Paul's pointing out the fault of listeners as to not accepting sound doctrine because it wasn't what they wanted to hear. Now, I've told you about the, the, uh, the, the church member once and when I knew if the sermon stepped on her toes, you know, I got a phone call a day or two later because people come to church to feel good. 
It's nice to be uplifted. I like to be encouraged. I like to hear uh, good, positive feedback. We all do. But sometimes, you know, I, when I go to the doctor, I want to feel good. I want them to say, here's a prescription. Uh, you know, go take this or go home and, and rest for a couple of days or, or uh, you know, go, uh, I'm going to prescribe for you two weeks in the Bahamas or something like that. Uh, you can go and enjoy your, no, they wouldn't do that. But that's the kind of thing I want. I want to hear good things. But, you know, when the doctor came in to me and said that uh, we've got this lump on your thyroid and it's about an 80% chance it's cancer, do you think I felt good about that? Yeah, doctor, I'm ready to go out and start doing cartwheels in the street. I'm ready to go out and party because I might have cancer. No, I didn't feel good at all. But that is what I needed to be told. Why? Well, because how else am I going to treat it if I don't know that it's there? And when we come into church, sure, we like to be uplifted, but the, te the preacher stepped on my toe, that sermon. But before you call the preacher, maybe you stop and just think. He preached about gossip today. Am I a gossip? Is that why it was bothering me? He talked about covetousness, or he talked about whatever. Is, is, is that something that's the, the, in my life that I need to think about changing? Something I need to stop doing, or maybe it's something I need to start doing, whatever the context is. It's not always going to feel good to have to make change, but sometimes it's necessary. You know, these are listeners who, they just, they want the preacher to preach what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. That is what Paul is warning Timothy of. They just want to feel good. Church is more of a social gathering uh, in that case, just to come and kind of hear the latest news and show off our, our, our clothes and, and that sort of thing. And, and just just uh, just come in and it's all good and just go on out feeling uh, uh, feeling good and not make any changes to our lives, not grow any at all. The itching ears means that they are looking for novel teaching many times. That sound familiar? Remember when Paul was on Mars Hill? You know, they, that's the kind of thing there that said that the Athenians just sat every day, spent their time just hearing, looking for something new. So here's this guy that shows up. What's that guy saying over there? What's he babbling about? I don't know. Something weird about some resurrection, some guy named Jesus. I have no idea. Excuse me, sir. Uh, this thing you're saying here about this resurrection, we've never heard anything like this. Could you elaborate? Could you talk to us about that? Yeah, I happen to notice that you've got all these idols and altars to various gods, and you've got this one over here to the unknown god. So here, let me tell you about the unknown god. Use that as a jumping off point. And some of them believed, but a lot of them said, yeah, we'll hear you later on this matter. It kind of mocked them because it wasn't really, they didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't really what they expected. But teachers, but you can find a church that will teach you or, and proclaim whatever it is that you want in this day and time. And I think that's why so many of these people who call themselves progressive Christians, there are no rules. They don't believe the Bible as a rule. Or they'll believe little parts of it. But I think they're trying to create a Jesus in their image, a God in their image. I, I uh, approve of this or that. That's what I want to find in a church that will affirm whatever it is that I'm doing, no matter how sinful the Bible says it is. And it's my desires that I want satisfied. Now, we've got two extremes that come into play here. We've got one extreme over here that says, well, God is love. That's it. Uh, you know, he doesn't send anybody to hell. He doesn't punish or anything. It's all love. We've got the other extreme over here that says, uh, we're all terrible people. We're all going to hell. And unless you agree with me completely, I think we can find the middle in there somewhere. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's all of us, everybody. We are at one time, Romans 5 tells us, we are at one time, we're enemies of God. But now let's flip that over. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah, we're sinners. We're lost. We're hopeless. But because of Jesus Christ, we have hope. Because of Jesus Christ, we have a path to God. And so now answering. How, uh, what do we do to answer? And this is maybe not a complete list, but here's what we have. First of all, you got to pray about it. I don't believe Christians today are using prayer as much as we could or should. And spend time in prayer. Maybe, you know, there's a song uh, in our book about leading me to some soul today. I think it's in our book. But pray to, for God to lead you to a soul, to somebody that you can share 
the saving gospel of Jesus with. Second thing is bring the word. When we are going to talk to someone, we've got to have the word. It is the gospel that, that converts. It is the gospel that has power, the power to save. That's where we have to eventually get in to the word with them. Notice he says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, even if it's not convenient. That's the new King James Version. And he says, convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching, or preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Some people are going to try your patience on this. Some people, it's going to take a while. I know several people, it took months or years before they obeyed the gospel. And some, unfortunately, never did. But don't let it discourage you if it does take a while. It can. Be prepared to tell others about Jesus. Just be patient. There are some questions that I get from people. I'll be honest with you. I'm tired of them. There are some issues that people ask about that I'm tired of discussing. And I, and I just, no. Oh. But the thing you have to remember is no matter what question gets asked, there's always someone who hasn't heard the answer. And so that's why we, when we are, are answering people, even though it may be, you know, the one millionth time I've answered a question about why we don't have instruments or why this or why that, this person probably hasn't heard the answer, so I need to give them an answer with respect and patience, even though I may, you know, maybe not that's something that I, that I really want to discuss. We have to be sure to give full and correct instruction as best we can. I may not have an answer for you. They may ask me a question, I just say, hmm, I don't know. And that's all it means, I don't know. Doesn't mean you're dumb, doesn't mean you've lost the argument, it just means you don't know. You ever had a doctor tell you, you don't, that I don't know? I had that once. She just shrugged her shoulders and we had tried a few treatment things for a problem I was having. She just shrugged her shoulders and said, I don't know. The next step now would be to send you to a specialist because I've done everything I know to do. Uh, so it's okay. Doesn't matter what you're talking about. You, there's always going to be new stuff to learn. And we have to remember there's also a natural human resistance to doing things God's way. Go back to the Garden of Eden. God said, don't touch that tree. What did they do? They ate the fruit. There is just that resistance, especially if what you're telling me God says I need to do goes against all of my own tradition, my own history, my own everything that I've been taught. And dealing with this is going to be a tightrope sometimes, trying to uh, help people walk through that, that uh, uh, resistance they have to God's Word, because a lot of, we can't afford to mimic the culture around us. We can't just tell people what they want to hear. We can't just say, well, we got to change this and do that to be more inclusive. Any, as far as I'm concerned, anybody's welcome to come, but you, you can't come in and expect us to change to meet the lifestyle you want. You have to change to do what the Bible says. Not what I say, not what the elders, what does the Bible say? That's what it's going to come down to. Because, because that is the standard that we'll be judged by. We don't want to be harsh about it. You know, we like, they like to throw the judge not lest you be judged uh, at us. If we have a teaching, if we have a thus saith the Lord, then that's it. The judging's done. Try this. The next time you get pulled over, you're doing 20 over the speed limit, and the officer pulls you over. Officer, don't be judgmental. No. Yeah, sure, tell it to the judge. He's not being judgmental, is he? What's he doing? He's doing his job. His job is to enforce the law. You were going 20 over the speed limit. And that's the same with us. Here's what the Bible says. Our job is just to say what the Word says. Now, if someone has a problem and they want to ignore it, that's between them and God. Our part is just to teach. And then Bible-based teaching can help convince the unchurched that, there, that uh, sometimes it can be challenging. Just think about our, our lives and the growth that you've gone through since you became a Christian. It's challenging sometimes. And God's Word shows it, and then we can, uh, we can show them how we've overcome some of these challenges. We need application, not apology, not telling people, you know, when it, and, and I always wonder when we're discussing and someone says, well, I'm sorry, but I think blah, 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 why are you apologizing? If that's your opinion, fine. But does it back, is it backed up by Scripture? That's where we need the application. It doesn't matter. Uh, hearing what my church says or anything, what does the Word say? Remember, it, this can cause us uh, occasionally to wince, it can make us uncomfortable, it can make us squirm, but that can't be helped. 
And if that happens, then you know that there's something that needs changing, something that needs work. The Bible is a living book. Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 12 tells us it will have an effect on us. It demands we change our lives. It will challenge our thinking and our behavior. And it's good to be challenged. It's good to have to stop and think, okay, why do I believe this or believe that? And, and, the, and I believe X, but the Bible says, no, that's not right. So, oh, okay, now I've got a challenge before me to, to, to change to what the Bible says. Here's another thing we have to look out for in our culture once. The biggest lies is attributed to Charles Spurgeon. The biggest lie the devil ever told was that churches could win souls with entertainment. And I watched some uh, Easter presentations at some of these mega churches online. They had plays, they had lots of drama, they had comedy, they had lots of music. I wonder how much of that really changed lives. When people walked out of there, did they really have their lives changed? Were they, were they uh, helped for the better? Were they made to see sin in their lives? Were they made to see areas where they need to improve or areas where, they're, where they need to work? Well, I don't know. My hunch is probably not. Because when I look at some of these, quite frankly, if you had just turned the, the, um, the sound off and just asked me, okay, watch this film. Is this a rock concert or is this a church worship service? I don't know. It looks like a concert to me. Why? Well, because they're more in with the lights, the fog machines, all the drama, all of that. That looks to me like something I would expect to see down here at the Fisher, not in a Sunday morning church service. Sure, we can be uplifting, we can sing lively uh, songs and that sort of thing, but it doesn't need to be an entertainment atmosphere. And we've also, when we approach people, got to have the right attitude. Got to have the right attitude that says, hey, I'm here to help, I want to discuss. That Jesus said, go into teach, remember how you teach, you, you'll have discussion, questions, and, and have that right attitude that says, I want you, I'm going to heaven, I want you to go. And, and, and uh, take people along that way. And look here. First Peter says, be, In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. New King James says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So if someone asks you, and you know if people sometimes are just messing with you, but if someone says, hey, why do you believe the Bible? Why do you believe this part of the Bible? Why do you, uh, uh, do you go to the church you do? Do you have an answer? A, a nice, thought-out, respectful answer that you can give. And why do you believe uh, that you have to be baptized to be saved? I don't know, it's just what the preacher said. Uh, why, why are you a member of the Church of Christ? Well, uh, I don't know. It's just, uh, well, my, my parents took me there, and then my grandparents. Notice he says to give them a reason for the hope that is in you. Is that going to give a reason for your hope or help anyone else to have any hope? A couple of things to take away from this. Number one, be prepared. You know, uh, make sure that you're ready to give an answer. Now, notice he said be prepared to give an answer. He didn't say that the person asking the question is going to like your answer. He didn't say they're going to accept it. He just said, have an answer. What they do with it is up to them. Second, make it personal. What do I mean by that? Well, why is it you have this hope? Not why the preacher has it or why everybody who's a Christian has it. Why do you personally have this hope? And then conduct yourself in a way that respects the person asking. Don't treat them you know, like, like they just fell off a, a turnip truck or something. Treat them with respect that this is a, uh, an adult or, or a teenager or whoever. They're asking a legitimate question, and I want to uh, give them a legitimate answer. And like I said, they may not always like your answer, but have an answer that you can give them that will hopefully get uh, open up doors for a study. Peter wants us to prepare. Now this is if you back up from 1 Peter chapter 3, go back to chapter 2, prepare for a holy life. The exact opposite of what people are, expect uh, to be taught of Christians. You know, now, I, had, I didn't grow up in a church going home. I had a picture in my mind of what church was like. Boring, can't have any fun, it's all a bunch of do's and don'ts. And then I became a Christian and I learned more about it. But no, it's not at all what I thought it was. Holy living, though, is crucial to pleasing God and influencing others. 
When people see, oh, well, you're a Christian and you do this or do that, oh, oh, why should I become a Christian? You're not living any better or any different than I am. Secondly, it sets us apart mm. from people because oh, we're not reliant on the world's value system. We have a different, a better, superior value system. And remember, if we hang on to the world's values and we have nothing, uh, we, we don't have anything to give them. We don't have anything that makes this look uh, as a better life than what they're living now. If we start acting like them, if we start saying hey, any kind of sin, just come on in. Sure, you can practice it. We'll let you do whatever you want. That's not Bible teaching. The Bible has some standards. It does have some parameters that we have to stay within. Our citizenship, remember, is in heaven. It's not here on this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven where we eagerly await the, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Uh, yeah, I don't know when it'll happen, but one day we'll be standing before God. We'll have that citizenship. We will be, we will be uh, with the Lord for eternity. It's going to take some work. We've got to be alert to people. We'll look at this as we're going through the series. We've got to be alert to people uh, who are searching. I still believe there's people out there searching. Maybe not as obvious as it uh, has been in the past, but they're there. The fact that Jesus will one day return for his people, we have a challenge before us to be ready to give an answer to take the gospel to those who need it. So this morning, the song we're going to sing in just a minute, as is our custom, to give people a chance to respond. If you're subject to that invitation to becoming a Christian, being baptized for your sins, forgiveness, or just to get back on track, the song, I Am Resolved, okay, are you ready to make that resolution? to dedicate yourself or rededicate to the Lord? I can't answer that question, only you can. Your status before God, what do you think it is? Are you ready if the Lord should come back today? If that were to happen, are you ready to go home and be with Him? If you're not and we can help you and you'd like to respond, then we invite you to do so as we stand and as we sing. I am resolved, no Lord.